Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, a very, very good morning to all of you. Uh, such a pleasure it is on our side to have your very valued pre presence here in the Assembly of Minds uh, in this beautiful, beautiful setting of Kyoto. It's my pleasure, ladies and gentlemen, uh, on behalf of the organizers and the hosts themselves and to the, uh, on behalf of the many hands who've worked so hard to put up this event, uh, this convergence here in Kyoto, uh, to welcome you all with the deepest felt warmth uh, to the 2023 uh, IGF. And uh, in the face of uh, so many dynamism and so many elements and aspects of life on planet Earth, of course, um, it's, it's, it's uh, um, the, the internet's ability, as we all know, to adapt and be a catalyst for economic resilience has we believe you agree, being never, never as important. And it is, it is at the heart of uh, the solutions and the deliberations uh, that uh, we seek, providing us with innovative tools, global connectivity and opportunities to forge ahead on the path of the aspired prosperity, solidarity, and collaboration. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, these are the very opening uh, uh, thoughts that we would want to share as we look forward to opening the, uh, the very first engagement here at this main hall of the 18th IGF. And I'm Shivani Thapa Bosneth, uh, your privileged moderator. I, uh, I'm, a, I'm a news editor, senior news editor with Nepal Television. That's the state media there, and feel very, very honored and privileged to be having this uh, responsibility of steering you all through this, uh, the, the very first panel, uh, the high-level track session here in the main hall uh, of this venue. And uh, uh, I. I it's a matter of great pride and pleasure to share that we are having the participation of over 8,000 participants from across 170 countries at the 18th IGF, which already in itself is a testament or a demonstration of the gravity of the agendas and the sector that we represent and would be deliberating herein. Said that, allow me quickly now to join the esteemed panel who are here, and uh, I really, really feel uh, privileged to be uh, placed uh, beside them as we look forward to uh, beginning the very first high-level track session. Uh, for your kind information, we have uh, translation services in six different UN official languages. So if you would, if you seek to uh, have those services, we have uh, provision of headsets which are placed uh, at your tables uh, and uh, I said that, allow me now to kindly set the context for the very first high-level track session of the 18th IGF. Uh, in, this, in this very digital age, it is certainly needless to say this, but in this digital age, we find ourselves in, a, in an era where data has become the lifeblood of the global economy and society at large as well. Now, the rapid development of technologies such as artificial intelligence, uh, IOT, as well as the blockchain, uh, and so many more. These have fostered an unprecedented growth in the volume as well as the velocity of data. Uh, however, the need is for us to recognize that along with this enormous potential for progress, there are complex challenges and risks that come with it. Um, and also there are needs uh, which are um, which which need to be addressed uh, uh, as soon at the soonest to create a synergy uh, amongst the stakeholders uh, that uh, uh, stakeholders most importantly in a bid to understand the chemistry of all these uh, elements. Now the first high level track session, ladies and gentlemen, of the 18th IGF uh, is all about data flow. Uh, the concept of data free flow uh, with trust, that's DFFT, intersects, as you all know, technology, commerce, governance, and many, many other aspects and dimension. At its core, DFFT proposes facilitating the unimpeded movement of data across geographical boundaries while simultaneously holding trust and security. Now, this session uh, will seek to give a better 
general understanding of DFFT, uh, examine its implications and identify potential areas of agreement for its applications. And I am indeed very, very much uh, pleased. In fact, it's my distinct honor uh, to introduce uh, to you all our most esteemed and distinguished panelist. Uh, first and foremost, please welcome Mr. Taro Kono, uh, the Honorable Minister for Digital Transformation Japan. Uh, likewise, our second panelist, Ms. Courtney Gregoire, the Chief Digital Safety Officer, Microsoft. As our third panelist, we have Mr. Junhua Lee, the United Nations Under Secretary General for Economic and Social Affairs. And last but not the least, Ms. Leonida Mutuku, AI Research and Strategy Lead, Local Development Research Institute. With much pleasure and privilege, I extend a warm welcome to all our distinguished panelists. Um, considering the theme, ladies and gentlemen, of the session, I will uh, initiate our discussion by posing uh, questions, and I will take turns in placing the questions uh, to our panelists. Uh, so beginning with the first question of the session, uh, first and foremost, moving to uh, Honorable Minister for Digital Transformation Japan, Mr. Taro Kono, uh, there, there are certainly uh, is no doubt that countries understand uh, you know, the importance of securing the cross-border transfer and access of data. We, we also have seen different uh, domestic approaches to data flow uh, emerges in response to economic privacy and national security concerns and possibly from a lack of trust among major trading partners. Uh, Honorable Minister, what can DFFT do for a fragmented global landscape on data flows by enhancing trust. Thank you. Good morning and uh, welcome all to Kyoto. Well, our economy has become data-driven economy and uh, new technologies such as generative AI uh, you have to feed a lot of data set to train them. So data is very important and the lifeblood of our economy. But uh, if we look at the global landscape of data or data governance, it's very much fragmented. So everyone agree that data need to be able to travel around the world without uh, interruption or delay and with very predictable manner. But uh, uh, it is quite difficult because people have different idea about uh, privacy and security. It is more ideological or even theological. I mean, you can talk to each other, understand what the other side actually think or believe, but it would be very difficult to have uh, a convergence. So DFFT uh, need to address um, the way to increase interoperability of uh, uh, data related uh, regulations and uh, DFFT need to uh, discuss issue of uh, reliability and accuracy of data itself. Uh, right now, we see a lot of misinformation or disinformation coming up. So accuracy and the reliability of data is important. And thirdly, we need to discuss issues of credibility of originator or sender of data and the history of how the data has been uh, modified. So in order to um, talk about privacy and uh, security or trustworthy of data, um, I think we need to solve the issue of gaps. So DFFT is to uh, enable uh, policymakers, academia, and private sector to collaborate uh, with uh, 
discussion and uh, technology. Uh, we have had so many forums to talk about data, but uh, it's ad hoc, it's more sectorial. So we are talking about uh, creating an international arrangement to provide uh, permanent uh, space to discuss issues concerning data, and we need to create a momentum, not just for policymaker, but for private sector and academia to talk about uh, these data issues. And uh, data, you have to discuss, not just the policy alone, you have to discuss the issue of technology. You need to incorporate technology to make data reliable, trustworthy, and make data travel uh, across the border. So we need to create the momentum and the space to discuss and implement a concrete project to enable data to travel across border with trust. And that is the concept of uh, DFFT. So hopefully, uh, as we agreed among G7 and uh, agreed among G20, we would like to set up an international arrangement for partnership to discuss data issues, cross-border data issues with many countries, not just limited to G7 or G20, but we need to include every country to join the discussion. And uh, we need to implement a concrete project to allow data to uh, travel cross-border, even though we may not agree on how we're going to regulate uh, uh, data transfer. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Honorable Minister. That is quite an optimistic view where he uh, says it's pretty much doable to fill all those gaps and loopholes through institutionalizing partnership in uh, arranging for, uh, you know, covering the loopholes and voids. Uh, moving to uh, His Excellency, the UN Under Secretary General, uh, what would be your say in this particular regard? Thank you. Thank you, Madam Moderator. Um, good morning, everyone. It is a great pleasure to join all of you in Kyoto um, and together with some uh, outstanding panelists. Um, I just want to extra um, uh, underline that our special thanks to the government of the Japan and also the remarks by um, Minister Kono. With regard to this initiative, DFFT, um, as we all know that it was suggested by uh, it was proposed by the G7 and discussed at the G20. I just want to follow uh, Minister's remarks. If the, today is a good opportunity to further develop this idea and hoping that we could arrive there somewhere as a, at the global scale. But how we can do that? Then I took your word, trust. To UN, trust means partnership. Trust means general participation. And also, I guess everyone noticed that about three weeks ago in the UN headquarters, we had the SDG Summit, the Sustainable Development um, Summit. Why we had that? Because we did not have a rosy picture before this. The SDG, uh, SDG program was initiated 2015, and after eight years, only about 15 targets will be on, on track, and more than one third either off the track or recessioned. So that's the, the very, very severe situation we are facing. So how we could advance the 2030 agenda, data, digital, that's most, one of the most powerful tools at our disposal. So to advance this DDF, then we need to involve more participation from majority of the UN members in its contents, in its regulations, and its the potential benefits. And also, 
not only limited to the government, but more essentially, we need to involve the general public, all stakeholders, including NGOs, the civil society, private sector, academia, technic uh, technical communities, youth, because they are the future users and the deciders for this. So that's something that we really cared about it. We hope that based on our discussion today, we may see the new sign, new impetus for this uh, new initiative. Thank you. Let us quickly take the say of both the panelists, the remaining panelists now, moving with uh, Ms. Leonida Mutuku. Again, the same question, what, what can DFFD do for a fragmented global landscape on data flows by enhancing trust? Uh, good morning, everybody, and uh, thank you for that question. Um, I'd like to take a moment to um, reflect on some of the points that my fellow panelists have brought about, specifically the issue of participation. I think with uh, DFFTs that um, of when you, there's created trust in those data flows, then it uh, increases the likelihood of participation from everyone and that no one is left behind. However, um, as part of responding to your question, I'd like to take the time to reflect a little bit on the recommendations of the Africa Union's data policy framework. And um, this was ratified by African Union member states last year. And the policy really adopts an approach of people-centered uh, approaches to cross-border data sharing and policy frameworks around that. So this means that we locate the people um, at the center of these data ecosystems and allow then policymakers to leverage on that as they are creating policies. And so this in a way considers the uneven economic and human development that uh, tends to take place in emerging economies such as the one I represent. So for data flows uh, to, to, to really build that trust, of course now we need to move beyond the utopia uh, that uh, is created by this concept and thinking about, uh, I would suggest three things to start with. Um, ca data categorization. Uh, what kind of data do we actually want to flow uh, across borders? Is this personal versus non-personal data? And, and what is the purpose of this data uh, flowing across borders? And then uh, how will the beneficence of that be realized? Secondly is, are the data flows unilateral? I think for data flows uh, to be uh, trustworthy, they have to move both ways. And that also contributes to mutual beneficence, bo uh, both from the countries receiving the data, but also exporting data. And then finally, um, the quality of the data itself. Uh, as was mentioned earlier on, uh, we need high quality data that um, can be used uh, across uh, different sectors. And some of these standards have already been established by uh, movements such as open government, open government partnership. And so uh, by having high quality data uh, moving, then uh, we increase the level of trust that um, there will be representation but also that uh, we do not exacerbate any discriminatory practices because um, different uh, groups of people are uh, represented in this data. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for those very comprehensive and very invaluable observations. Coming to Ms. Courtney Gregoire, if you could add on to these observations. Sure. Ohayo gozaimasu, omaneki itadaki, mashite arigato gozaimasu. Microsoft strongly supports facilitation of cross-border data flows and the data free flow with trust. And at the outset, I really want to acknowledge a heartfelt thanks to Japan for leading this initiative. As former Prime Minister Abe stated in the G20 declaration, cross-border flow of data, information, ideas, and knowledge generates higher productivity, greater innovation, and improved sustainable development. But we have a very good question on the table. How do we help everyone understand what is the value behind the free flow of data with trust? And that means getting first and foremost at the concept of what is trust. We all 
All users, all citizens of the world must feel confident that our data is moving securely and our most sensitive information is protected. This means keeping core principles at the heart of the work. That is privacy, safety, security, and transparency. We need strong commercial privacy protections to ensure that all, all those know that their information is being well protected. And we need trusted mechanisms to transfer information because at the end of the day, the reason behind this, which was said so well, must be human-centered for all to, to gain value and opportunity. We need clear rules to regulate government access to data for that same purpose and, and moving forward. At the end of the day, we know that trust is best built through multi-stakeholder collaboration, where there is true conversation around the table with all of those that are interested and their interests are well respected. I think at the end of the day, the heart of the Institutional Arrangement Partnership is to bring that multi-stakeholderism together, to learn the best practices and ensure that as we're advancing this framework, we do it with trust at its center, the trust that users know that their, their trust is going to be respected and their value that they will get out of this work. There is more work to do to make this a reality, but it needs to be brought about with, with all of the principles we've talked about here. Core to that is how data will be used in the future to advance privacy, to advance safety and security. We do get to have a conversation about what this means in practice, but the opportunities it means both to advance environmental sustainability, to think about truly pressing global health issues, and have a more equitable economic opportunity are things we get to explore a little bit more, I think. So thank you. Great. I, we can see there's quite a great understanding of the common uh, issues and problems in, in, in the, this, despite us all having a great aspiration to creating the aspired. However, there could be any, uh, there, there could be hurdles and obstacles to realizing what we aspire for. And amongst the, um, the range of all the uh, hurdles or obstacles, one important is the inequalities that is prevalent among the stakeholders and of course among the nations. Now, a pillar, of, uh, this, a pillar of the SDG agenda is the reduction of inequalities within, the, within and between the countries as outlined in SDG 10. So data and cross-border data flows are increasingly important for development and in many ways considered the lifeblood of current economies. Data-driven technologies, as, you, as we all know, rely on large amounts of data, yet the developing countries with smaller populations may be at a natural disadvantage in this context. So how could responsible cross-border data flows address this prevalent imbalance? I would want to come back to Ms. Courtney. I, I think this is a great question, and we need to realize and it's been said by almost all of our panelists, including the minister, that we are at this era in which we are at a data-driven economic opportunity. And as we think about bridging the gap from an inequality perspective, that means really having a serious conversation about where is the future opportunity and, and growth. Um, it was actually a 2020 World Economic Forum study that found that approximately half of cross-border services trade is enabled by digital connectivity. If we are looking for the opportunity and the future growth for all countries, and particularly micro and small and medium-sized enterprises, it means truly that bilateral, that fully flow of data that advantages all for the future of economic opportunity. I think we have to take a hard look at the reality of right now. Data is flowing in many ways, but that may be flowing unilaterally and not raising all opportunity around globally. So as we have this conversation, we know that innovation it will be fueled by a truly protected data free flow with trust. And innovation and economic opportunity, when given to all, will rise an economic in, a, in global equitable context. This is the opportunity that we want to think about. Moreover, if you think about equity, we need to think about economic, we need to think about social opportunity, and we need to truly think about what it means from a global health perspective. And we'll talk a little bit more about this, but if there hasn't, if there's truly been the mother of all innovation, it would probably be the COVID-19 pandemic that made everyone understand the core role data has in unlocking not just economic innovation, but health innovation that is core to opportunities. 
Think about what that means to addressing some of the true global health inequity that has kept back many across the globe. So these are the, spa the places that we have to have a more tangible conversation about what data means. What does data mean for the lives of those individuals, or what it can mean as an opportunity for both future growth and future opportunity. It may feel esoteric. We need to make it real and have that conversation as to why this is important. And Ms. Mutuku, could you add to these observations, please? Uh, thank you very much. Um, when I think about um, how to address this issue of uh, Inequality, I think about uh, what it means to actually, first of all, exacerbate it. And we see that with data flows, as, as has already mentioned, that are happening, uh, data tends to be extracted from one jurisdiction to another. The question, though, is once this data moves across borders, who is processing it? And do they understand the context and nuances of where the data originated? And so to to be able to counter the imbalances that would um, arise, then it is really important to have at this juncture uh, participation also in the processing of data by people who have context and understanding of, of the nuances that uh, the data holds from the jurisdictions in which they, um, they, it, they were extracted from. Secondly, um, it's the issue of scarcity mentality. Uh, having been an AI researcher, one thing we like is to have as much data as possible to, to create these uh, systems that uh, will uh, have, make decisions on behalf of people. But the question is, do we really need all that data or should we be very cr critical and careful of the data that we want to uh, access and utilize to, to, to make these decisions? So. In this sense, if we are only using the relevant data, then it doesn't matter um, how, um, how much data, let's say, is possessed or could be collected from a population. What matters is what uh, specific data will be utilized to make decisions in that context. Uh, and one example I'd like to give a, uh, to, to illustrate this is the issue of language data. Uh, we do want, of course, uh, for instance, some of our most under-resourced languages to be represented in systems of the future. But uh, there's the issue of if you're not participating on the other end of it to, to process this data, then the issues such as mistranslations or uh, that missing of context may arise. So even as we think about data, uh, uh, data flows, I think it's the ultimate use of that data that could potentially increase the quality and having participation by also representatives of the data in processing it can help um, mitigate that. Thank you. Thank you. My next question is centrally directed to Mr. Lee and then I'll come to uh, Ms. Leo and then to the rest of the panelists. Uh, so monitoring progress uh, towards the SDGs uh, requires high quality disaggregated data. And of course, mapping interactions among different initiatives to meet the goals. Now, can monitoring and data flows across borders be significant for cooperative SDG efforts, particularly in the surveillance of ecosystems and for environmental cooperation? Well, I guess um, uh, very straightforward answer is. Yes, very positively, because uh, cross-border data sharing and the international cooperation are essential for achieving the SDGs. People may ask the why. I guess everyone would agree with me that the SDGs is about the global in nature. It's not about the individual country, about the individual group. It's about the whole membership or the human humankind. So many of our challenges we are facing is cross-border. Cross it's a global. So definitely, logically, naturally, we called for the international cooperation and the data sharing to tackle the, all those challenges. And monitoring and sharing the data, of course, 
um, are essential to tackle those transboundary uh, challenges. But I have to say that um, just now we talked about inequality in data or digital divide between the countries or even within the countries. That is a, one of the serious phenomenon we have to tackle with. We need to give the policy consideration how we could bridge the gap to addressing the quality data and to uh, ensure the data sharing across the border and lay down the solid basis for the international cooperation. And of course, we, United Nations, and particularly my department, the Eco Department of the Economic and Social Affairs, we have devoted the 70 years to facilitate the member states in capacity building and also norm setting, international norms, governing the data sharing and governing the data collecting, of course, and its utilization. And it also, just recently, my department launched, we called it the UN Data Commons for the SDGs, a platform that integrated into the authoritative the SDG data and information sources is from all the UN entities. It's not about a single UN entity. It's a, a cross-carding from all UN entities. But one thing that I just want to underline, that is cross-border sharing also fostered the collaboration and knowledge exchange. Just, just um, to give you an example for the uh, disaster reduction, we need early warning system. That essentially means the data sharing would serve the very fundamental thing for the early warning system. Thank you. Ms. Leo, what would you say to this? I would actually say I'm in 100% agreement around the partnerships. And I'd like to highlight, for instance, when we think about um, surveillance for ecosystems, that one of the interesting partnerships that are coming about are um, around um, Earth observations, for instance. And when we look at uh, a continent like Africa, uh, initiatives that are uh, uh, propose uh, data partnerships amongst uh, nations, enable us to be able to surveil uh, similar ecosystems, but at the same time be able to collect data uh, through earth observations that uh, the countries might not necessarily have the capacity to do themselves, but with institutions such as the space agencies who already are surveilling. Um, but the question again comes back to who, what is the capacity then to, to provide policy oversight uh, and uh, to manage these partnerships. And this is where it's really interesting uh, to be able to um, capacitate the government institutions, policy institutions to provide oversight over these um, cross-border data sharing to, to support SDGs, but at the same time uh, also creating um, that uh, ability to trust in the institutions themselves that are uh, collecting this data uh, by, by people whose lives will be impacted by the decisions made from this data. And, and this trust is built by understanding um, whether these institutions are transparent and accountable uh, to, to the people, but at the same time, whether there's a relevant engagement, especially in mass surveillance systems, uh, if there's relevant engagement to explain to, to citizens that these data sets are being utilized for these specific um, indicators, then it's, it's, it, it creates that trust. And, and one thing that we have to be cognizant about is that um, a lot of societal issues that the SDGs aim to address are intersectional. And that means that um, issues are touched by different data sets collected for different reasons and in different sectors. So when we think about, for instance, uh, trying to ensure that uh, uh, different genders, women, and uh, marginalized groups are represented in the data, in the context of agriculture, there's nutrition, energy, uh, and health that are intertwined in that issue. So the partnerships then uh, enable you to be able to address this inter 
intersectional uh, issues because you are able to bring all the relevant data collectors onto the table uh, to, to collectively address these SDGs. Quite, uh, quite relatable and uh, realistic. What would your thoughts be, Ms. Grigoy? It's actually, I, I reflect on our opportunity we had to chat backstage before coming out on this panel. It's probably worth noting that our conversation couldn't help but drift to the impacts that climate change were having on all of our lives across the globe. And so thinking about this important question really is at the heart of what data can do uh, to really truly drive sustainability changes uh, and accelerate the transition to a clean energy economy. Uh, Microsoft has been making a deep investment in this for many, many years. And if we think about what data can do in this context through policy and investments that harness this power, we can think about the future for climate, water, ecosystems, and a resilient clean energy grid. I'm going to give two concrete examples. First, all of us want to make sure that those who've made true commitments to achieving climate targets are actually achieving them at the community level, at the business level, at the nation state level. And that means being data driven in the approach. Microsoft has invested with Global's Renewable Watch to track energy resources like wind and solar installations to help make this a reality and bring transparency to those who've made the commitments and should be held accountable. But at the end of the day, we also have a real pressing issue right now, and that is helping those around the world adapt to changes in the climate. And one of the partnerships that AI powered through data, we've done through Project Farm Vibes, has been to help farmers adapt to climate change and make better decisions around planting, water, watering, and fertilizing crops. We know this is the underlying infrastructure to achieving our sustainability goals and helping everyone around the world adapt to a changing and evolving climate. And these two concrete examples we believe could help change that conversation at a realistic level for all. And lastly, may I turn to the Honorable Minister to share his perspectives on this. Thank you. Um, let's say for curbing climate change, in order to uh, do that, we need accurate and trustworthy data on carbon footprint throughout the uh, supply chain. And the supply chain nowadays go beyond the national border. So we need to make sure the data measured accurately and the numbers calculated correctly and data are not uh, tampered. And uh, I think country need to share those data on, in an interoperable manner. So that's where uh, DFFT comes in. In order to do all those SDG project, uh, no country can do that alone. Everyone need to exchange data and uh, make sure the data is accurate, uh, correct, and not tampered. So we need to increase the interoperability of cross-border data flow. Uh, so it is important for across the board on SDG project. And that's where the FFT comes in. Well, great. Uh, coming from the reflections uh, of the observations and perspectives shared by the panelists, uh, we understand the needs and urgency as well. And especially if you look back in the recent past, the uh, COVID pandemic has been uh, an awakener for almost all the global entities and nations. It has awakened our perspectives, our thoughts, the needs, everything, and many things surrounding data itself. So the, the, the disclosure of health-related data across borders during those COVID-19 pandemic was critical as you already have already acknowledged in mitigating uh, the harm to the societies back then in the time of chaos and even the, in the aftermath. Now, considering the 2030s agendas imperative to ensure health and well-being for all, and the then that risks are increasingly you know borderless as we have seen it by ourselves. What can be or what are the possible scenarios for trusted and equitable data sharing for health? Over to Ms. Leo. 
Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I'd like to bring your attention to um, the surveillance systems that a lot of um, at least African countries use uh, for, for health. Uh, this is uh, use of the DHIS2, which is an open source tool that um, countries can periodically um, log different health-related indicators in this system. And when you look at DHIS2, uh, the demographic and health surveys data that populates it tends to be anonymized and, and disaggregated enough though to pick uh, trends of health and nutrition outcomes across different indicators. So in this sense, these data sets are um, in, in a manner very granular enough to make uh, relevant decisions and can be shared safely, uh, especially uh, when we consider that personalized data is not uh, included in the systems. And so that uh, having uh, different countries create frameworks around uh, sharing of DHIS2 data and how um, that could be used to surveil potential outbreaks or potential um, health uh, issues that are could ideally be um, reviewed in a regional perspective. The second thing I would like though to, to, to reflect on is when we move away from these larger data sets to now um, thinking about uh, where we are going, uh, creating health systems using AI, um, some interesting data sets that are collected in countries such as um, x-rays and scans could ideally be utilized and shared safely to, to support uh, you know, disease discovery as well as uh, new ways of treating them. However, an issue arises in this sense is that um, the data attribution. Uh, how do you, how do we know that um, these data sets uh, were selected by uh, who and what um, is the level of trust in that data, but at the same time, what dividends do the owners of those data sets get once this data is utilized um, globally? And so even as we reflect on these positive opportunities for cross-border data flows, uh, we need to really think about uh, the contributors of the data, the authors, um, what dividends they do, um, get from this as well as um, how we can attribute their contribution to, to these systems. Coming to Minister Kano, I'm sure Japan has a wealth of experience and knowledge to share from the pandemic and the post era. Well, thank you. Well, for COVID, uh, in order to analyze what COVID is, uh, to develop vaccine and uh, in order to administer vaccination, we needed to use uh, data and uh, we need to share the data and uh, we need to uh, increase our computer power to analyze those data. But, uh, well, well, we'll probably have another pandemic sometime and we need to be prepared. But our health-related data is very, very sensitive. So we may be a bit more careful using those personal health data. Um, there's something called uh, federated uh, learning AI technologies, uh, which is to make AI trained for diagnosis and the prescription of medicine without sharing, without gathering uh, personal health data at one point. Uh, so the policy makers are not always aware of new emerging technologies. So it is very important to have policy makers sit down with engineers, experts, academia, private sector uh, to discuss what is available at that moment. What is the latest technology? So we, the policy makers, politician, understand what is available, what is the latest technology available to do each project. So that's why we believe it is important to have government and non-government uh, stakeholders to sit down and uh, discuss each issue. And that is particularly important for health-related uh, project. All right, thank you, thank you, Mr. Minister. Uh, can I turn to Mr. Lee, if you could add your insights to these possibilities? 
Well, that I guess um, uh, if the, we do have the participation from the all stakeholders on the CDFFT, then certainly we would have the much more prim a promising future uh, for this as a kind of the instrument, policy instrument, and a technical instrument. Uh, coming to Ms. Courtney Grigoire. I think this has been well said, but it, it's true that we experienced the COVID-19 epidemic becoming somewhat of a mother of innovation that incentivized organizations around the world to shift their approach and understand that immersive sharing of data was critical to the future for my public health perspective, and they needed to do that in a way that had trustworthy frameworks that enhanced the privacy. When we talk about core health data, as the minister noted, this is the most highly sensitive. This is the, the area that will probably be the biggest concern for, for users to think about what does this mean to me? How could I be disadvantaged? Would sharing of this data impact my privacy or impact my future ability to access health care or get the right treatment. And so we recognize the public health opportunities, but the fear from a user perspective means that privacy must be at the heart. While we've seen progress, uh, we also see uh, the lack of clarity around regulatory requirements for health data um, truly impacting, restricting, uh, slowing global advances in some research areas. So this is an area that we just heard from everybody. You have to have all the stakeholders around the table, those that understand the technology opportunities that mean we can truly do this in a privacy, not just protective, but enhancing manner for the public health opportunities that we want around the globe. Uh, and it is an area that is going to make perfect sense that needs multi-layered regulatory approach given the sensitivity of the underlying data. Coming, uh, summing up from all the opinions and perspectives or insights that have been shared at this forum so far, uh, right at, at this moment, we look in common consensus that we need to create that synergy and find the mechanism or put that mechanism in place to address, identify overall the, the loopholes in, in, uh, in helping us reap or uh, harness from the uh, prospects and the potentials that data flow brings along. But the question is, what kind of mechanism? What kind of mechanism or framework for cross-border data flow is required to bring uh, the governments and the stakeholders together to achieve the goals that we discussed here today? May I begin with the Honorable Minister? Thank you. Well, in the past, uh, discussion on data or data governance was quite ad hoc and uh, sector-based, I guess. Uh, you can talk about uh, data in terms of trade policy or in terms of privacy. Or when you're talking about environment, you talk about the data policy or health. Um, we need to, when we talk about data, I think we need to talk across the board. We need to talk about how we going to uh, govern the data policy itself. And we also need to create a, a continuous uh, discussion so that's why Prime Minister Abe back in 2019 proposed the idea of DFFT. Um, the, in order to operationalize DFFT, we have been talking about a international forum with a permanent secretariat. Uh, we've been talking about among the G7 countries and this year, uh, there was a G7 digital ministers meeting and uh, we agreed among the G7 country, we have agreed to set up an international uh, framework with a permanent secretariat that was endorsed by the G7 leaders. And uh, we have agreed to set up international forum under umbrella of an international organization. Well, we can talk about data policies, data governance policies, but Europeans have a GDPR, United States have, well, the Wild West, anything goes in US. 
So it'll be very difficult to have uh, convergence. But, but as I said, it's, it's going to be a theological issue. But okay, the data policy set aside, we need to operationalize free flow of data with trust. So this international framework, we call it uh, international uh, arrangement for partnership. We will discuss a concrete projects uh, to uh, operationalize DFFD. So what we are thinking about is we will set up this international forum and under the umbrella of international organization with permanent secretariat. We need a government panel uh, among the policymakers, but we also need non-governmental experts panel, um, experts invited from the private sector academia. And we need to take up concrete project. I believe we need to uh, talk about international database on data uh, regulations, data governance policy of each member state. So you can go into their database and find out what each country require you to do uh, if you wanna do business in certain country. And we constantly need to update. We also need to create a regulatory sandbox. There's a lot of new emerging technology or pets, privacy enhancing technologies. We need to create a regulatory sandbox to test each emerging technology. And if it passes, if it's passed, uh, it should be able to apply each member state. And we'll probably need to take up some concrete project for uh, each issues like health, environment, um, things like that. So we'll probably need a permanent uh, secretariat and a government panel, non-government panel. That's what we are trying to do. Thank you, thank you, Honorable Minister. Moving now on to the rest of the panelists, beginning with Mr. Lee, what are your thoughts on this? Thank you. I just want to follow the comments by uh, Minister Kano. Uh, we all recognize that there's a huge gap in the global data governance structure. So definitely we need a global framework or mechanism to enhance the global data governance, including uh, data flow with trust. But however, I just want to share the one aspect of during my conversation with uh, some policymakers from the global south developing members, they are very concerned that now probably they will become the primary data providers to the business located some, um, somewhere, but not in their own territories. So potentially limiting their governments and the local business access to their own data. This dynamic could potentially disadvantage them in international markets, in international cooperation. That is the why we need to strengthen the national institutions and accountability, particularly with regard to the global assistant to the global files to bridge the gap in the digital divide. And this required not only the assistance from the global files, but it also need a regulatory framework and a stronger public digital infrastructure and data capacity. And this required a buy-in and the participation from almost all stakeholders on agreement on the robust data sharing practices and the governance structure. Thank you. Coming to you, Ms. Courtney Grigoy. I am also echoing what I think was very well said, um, a recognition that the gaps that inhibit the ability to truly achieve the goals we've talked about here, both come in the form of national laws, lack of adequate mechanisms, lack of technology understanding of how one can do this in a privacy enhancing way. And it's because of this that we really do embrace the broad agenda of the institutional arrangement for partnerships to think holistically about what are the regulatory and implementation gaps. 
how to promote interoperability of the rules, and clarifying where international organizations with relevant expertise can lead. We all understand that one of the fundamental drivers of mistrust in data flows, both at the consumer level and at the government level, is third-party access to data, and specifically fear that another government will compel a technology provider to release personal data belonging to an individual or an organization that we are very glad to see progress both bilaterally and at the international level to focus on this important issue, bringing principles and trusted frameworks, including most recently the OECD trusted government access principles that would create additional transparency about the rules for government access are and demonstrating that commonality that already exists between rights respecting democracies. This is critical and foundational to continuing to expand the trust that is needed at the core of this work. And we hope to continue to enhance that work across multilateralism and, yes, between the US and the EU, uh, as mentioned before, as a critical place for framework of trust. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Krikor. Coming to Ms. Leo Mutuku, uh, you could build on the perspective, share it in, or if you could add more on what kind of mechanism could work or look comprehensive. Um, I think just that emphasis on, on that multi-stakeholderism, but uh, what we could borrow is from corporate governance practices, really the establishment of a data strategy before we even um, think about uh, promoting trust within data flows. What we need to define and categorize the data that will be subject to these data flows and the level of participation, especially when we start thinking about governments uh, that want to establish these um, partnerships, it's what level of participation uh, are you, your, the companies in your jurisdiction, as well as um, on the receiving end, uh, will, will they take place? And then this ensures that practices are, uh, are not extractive and that there is, uh, in the most uh, ideal instance, this reciprocal access that uh, the countries that enter into partnerships uh, hold strategic benefits for both um, countries in this partnership. And finally, one thing that uh, these data strategies uh, will ensure is that um, without thinking too much about sovereignty versus localization, that ethical and cultural sensitivity is still maintained, um, especially in cases where the data that might need to flow um, involves indigenous communities or there is the likelihood of sensitive cultural uh, information. So once the strategies are in place, then other um, operationalization initiatives such as what was proposed by uh, Minister Kono, including um, the regulatory or operational sandboxes then can, can be established. And then finally, it's very critical as this is happening to do monitoring and evaluation. That way we are sure that uh, we can correct any missteps as they take place. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, ladies and gentlemen, this was an attempt from our side to bring forth the opinions and perspectives from uh, the wide range of uh, esteemed and distinguished panelists that represented policy leaders, uh, academia, uh, the experts, and also the stakeholder community on a very pertinent topic, uh, which happens to be one of the main and cross-cutting sub-themes of IGF 2023. And of course, one of the most pertinent uh, issues and topics of our time and the coming age, which we all agree is going to be determining for the economy and the overall uh, well-being of uh, us, of, of the global uh, ambience. And um, we, can see, uh, we can see a common consensus among all the panelists here in, uh, for, for fostering a collaborative environment where they believe that diversity of realities, diversity of issues, of viewpoints uh, would uh, allow for fruitful exchanges. Uh, now, as we come towards uh, the very, very final moments of this uh, high-level uh, discussion, may I now turn back to uh, the panelists themselves to, uh, to, as we wrap up, share some of their very forward-thinking ideas as to how to, we can shape a comprehensive understanding on the topic we've uh, just talked much about. 
beginning with the Honourable Minister. Thank you. <clears throat> well, as we say, our economy is most likely uh, going along with this data-driven economy and the new AI technology need a lot of data feeding so the accuracy, trustworthy of data is going to be very important. And uh, people are now uh, reading uh, disinformation, misinformation on their SNS, whether or not they have noticed that is not uh, accurate. So I think among the policy makers, among the uh, certain industries, academia, the importance of data is widely shared, and we have been discussing uh, issues concerning data. But uh, as a policymaker, as a politician, I need to reach out to the general public, and it's just not me. Uh, I guess all the policymakers need to reach out to the general public. Uh, industry probably uh, reach out to the general public. When we talk to the general public, how we can make people understand the importance of data or importance of uh, accuracy, trustworthy, worthiness of data, uh, that is quite difficult. So we constantly need to talk to the general public and uh, we need to constantly uh, try to make them see the threat uh, coming from disinformation, misinformation, uh, threats to our common values such as democracy, freedom, rule of law. That is under attack, under threat, coming from disinformation, misinformation, fake news, and all those things. So, and the, even media is under attack. The trust towards media is going down, as well as many uh, government institutions. So this information uh, or data issue is not just an economy issue, it is issue concerning our common values. And the uh, issue is how we make general public understand uh, the importance of this issue, how we going to get them involved in a discussion, and uh, what kind of technology uh, going to be available to counter this information, uh, establish trust of data is going to be important. So this is not just a policy issues. Uh, this is also technological issue as well. And this is going to be very important, not just for economy, but for the society uh, as well. Uh, that's what I would like to emphasize today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Minister. May I turn to His Excellency, um, the Under Secretary General? Thank you. Um, as we move to the digital society and even beyond, I, I certainly believe to advance this uh, DFFT um, is critically important for all of us. Uh, based on our discussion, I think the three brief points that I would like to share with you, all of you. First, it is important to bridge the digital divide within the country or between the countries. We need to ensure that the digital divides are not exacerbated by free data flows because some countries do not have the resources to compete with others in data economy. And we must enhance the public trust and ensure that the full involvement of the all stakeholders and all the developing countries at the all levels of the decision making. Second, it is important to ensure the privacy and the security of the data and the data application. We need to make sure the people's data is protected, especially when it, it is transferred to other countries. Third, to respect data sovereignty is also important. This is an area we need to think about it carefully. And the Secretary General of the United Nations, Mr. Antonio Guterres, actually proposed a 
Global Digital Compact, which actually would address the global data governance structure. This initiative would be discussed at the forthcoming Summit of the Future to be held in September 2024. We hoped and we strongly invite and urge all stakeholders to involve in this process to discuss, to consult with each other under the framework of the United Nations. If this new digital, global digital compact that could be endorsed by leaders when they meet in New York next September, from UN, we believed we do have a very sound, solid basis to move forward to all those global governance mechanism on its on data, on digital, or the other related areas. Thank you. Yeah, may I now come to Ms. Courtney Gregoire? I, I love the themes that have already been outlined um, as we sit and think about this criticality. Minister, you said it well. I think we're looking at a room of people who understand how core data, including cross-border data transfer, is to economic opportunity, to innovation, to tackling some of the world's greatest challenges, whether that is environmental sustainability or the world's next pandemic. But our average person does not understand this at their core. And so we come today to have a conversation about what does it mean to advance and institutionalize data free flow with trust. I think we need to think a little bit at the heart of what does the word trust mean. Microsoft ran a multi-year campaign, I actually think we still do, called Microsoft Runs on Trust. And what that was is to have everyone in our organization understand that you build trust every single day by a constant investment, and you can lose it within moments. We need to build a multi-year effort that is thinking about how to build trust constantly and continually in the face of uh, innovation and change, and recognize that we're talking about, in some spaces, a very sensitive issue that can be lost in seconds. We want the data to not just be a driver of innovation, but truly an opportunity for economic opportunity for all, and that's the change that's into the future. At the end of the day, I think a conversation that was raised by one of our panelists here, if we think about who we need to have a conversation about bringing into the forefront of this conversation, it is the next generation of users. It is our children and our teens who are using technology at every phase of their life and for which the decisions we will make around this will truly impact their lives for generations to come. Their voices can bring a new perspective and a new thought about how to be innovative, thoughtful, and truly build the trust from a global perspective. So that might be one opportunity for the future. Thank you so much. And to Ms. Leo for the very concluding remarks. Thank you to my fellow panelists for a very engaging conversation. Um, one thing I would leave us to reflect on is that we should not request, just make a blanket request for data free flow with trust. Um, trust has to be gained first and foremost, and it is only gained when institutions that hold data on people and those appointed to govern these data flows have legitimacy. And how will this legitimacy be built? There should be a, a, an opportunity to, ex, to close feedback loops. This means that these institutions should be transparent and accountable on what they do with this data, and that there's two-way engagement with quote-unquote data subjects. Um, that, um, and finally, that these uh, institutions are capacitated in the sense that they have the right skills to provide oversight and enforcement to ensure adherence to any rules that are set in place. So once this is done, then it is easier to build trust in data and data technologies that can transform progress towards achieving the SDGs. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, now towards the very end in wrapping up this session, we have witnessed a very subtle, uh, yet uh, very, uh, very insightful uh, thought sharing from our uh, very uh, prominent uh, and distinguished speakers herein. And now, it is very, very evident that the dialogue around uh, data governance might sound easy to the ears, but 
again, it is a very complex and multifaceted issue, uh, requiring a very, very delicate balance between the free flow of data and the establishment of trust. Uh, we, the panel, just explored various perspectives, observation, of course, uh, approaches as well, uh, where they, didn't, they shared uh, how important it is to strike a balance between privacy, security, innovation. Of course, they shed light on the potential benefits and challenges of uh, data localization, the need for global consensus on data governance principles, um, and also uh, they touched upon uh, the critical role uh, of transparency and accountability in fostering this much, much aspired trust. Uh, now, as we all look forward and move forward, uh, uh, the common reflection of the panel certainly is uh, is is in maintaining an inclusive multi-stakeholder uh, approach to ensure that the policies and frameworks that we develop are reflective of our uh, diverse realities, needs, and perspectives, uh, with cooperation and collaboration at the center of it all. And the most important uh, emphasis laid by the panel was in continuing to engaging in dialogue, uh, sharing the best practices and innovative solutions while keeping in mind the fundamental values around which our overall well-being rests on. Thank you. Thank you, distinguished members of the panel, for your very, very um, uh, valuable time that you spared to this forum. Of course, for your very thoughtful contributions, for the value that you bring to the entire uh, forum here in Kyoto, and uh, for the great work that you all have been doing in your own domains to shaping a digital future that is built on trust, inclusivity, and mutual understanding. And with these words, that's all from the panel, ladies and gentlemen. We thank you for, uh, for being a great audience. And as we call this session uh, off, may I request the distinguished panelists to kindly walk towards the left of the stage for a quick group photo opportunity. Thank you. And thank you. That's uh,